Some influencers succeed against all odds. Darren Walker did just that, then devoted his life to improving the odds for everybody else. A black and gay man from rural Texas, Walker made it on Wall Street, but he left it behind to volunteer full-time at an elementary school in Harlem. His expertise eventually brought him to the Ford Foundation, where he has served as president since 2013, controlling a $13 billion endowment that makes Ford one of the biggest philanthropic organizations in the United States. He's here to talk about wealth inequality, how he overcame it, and why others shouldn't have to. Hello everyone, I'm Andy Serwer and welcome to Influencers. And welcome to our guest, Darren Walker, president of the Ford Foundation and author of the new book, from Generosity to Justice, A New Gospel of Wealth. Darren, nice to see you. Great to be here, Andy. So let me ask you a little bit, uh, before we get to your book and the work you're doing at Ford, um, about a small controversy, perhaps, which is a group of artists that were upset that you supported the closing down of Rikers, which is the big jail in New York City, and moving prisoners to Ford detention centers. Where does that controversy stand at this point? Well, the good news is the Lippmann Commission, which made a set of recommendations that had as its highest priority closing Rikers, which is truly a scourge on the city of New York in an age of mass incarceration, a time when we at the foundation and many others around this country have committed ourselves to ending mass incarceration. What we're doing in New York City by closing Rikers and reducing the overall capacity to incarcerate is a good thing for our city. We will be a model of the way in which we can have a humane and just criminal justice system. So I'm actually quite pleased with the results of the commission and actually think the protests were helpful in raising the issue uh, in I think raising the debate for the public to understand, uh, I think, at a granular level, just why this is such an important public policy issue. Right. Your mandate at the Ford Foundation, what is it? What does your job entail? What do you seek to do there? Well, the Ford Foundation was founded in 1936 by Edsel Ford, and a major plank of our mission is to promote and strengthen democracy in the United States and around the world. We believe today that the greatest threat to democracy is growing inequality in the world. So our North Star is working to reduce inequality in all of its forms. I want to get to that in a little bit. Um, the New York Times did a story about you this year saying you were the man with a $13 billion checkbook. And I think you, that's slightly overstating because you only disperse, what, $650 million a year something on that order of magnitude. What is it like to have a job like that, Darren, where you're able to distribute so much money, quite honestly? Well, first of all, I'm very lucky that I have the best board of trustees of any foundation in the world. I have an enormously uh, supportive group of uh, board members who are uh, my uh, greatest champions and who also uh, hold me to account to deliver on that mission of uh, spending that $650 million in the most effective way that we can. And while it sounds like a lot of money, it is actually a drop in the ocean when we think about the challenges that we face. So as a foundation, we are working on uh, challenges around ending mass incarceration. Uh, we are advancing uh, an agenda around human and civil rights in the United States and America in America and in the world. We are uh, working uh, to uh, develop uh, systems and structures that promote more participation, more civic engagement. Um, we have to address the issue of workers and how we put workers at, uh, in, in discussions around the future of work so that it's not just work, but workers and their uh, resilience and stability uh, that is our focus. And finally, the arts. Uh, 
the importance of the arts in this country. The arts gives us uh, a way in to look at ourselves as a people, to develop more empathy, and that is essential because we can't be a just nation without being an empathetic nation. Right, you mentioned the arts, and I saw that you said, or someone reported that you sold all the art and bought a whole bunch of new art. Was it really all the art? And, and how do you make those kinds of decisions? Well, the board uh, decided that as we reimagined the Ford Building that our uh, 1950s art collection was probably not consistent with our uh, 2020 social justice focus. Uh, there were no uh, women, uh, uh, no people of color in the collection. Really? Just zero? Zero. Wow. And the, uh, the belief was, and, and I'm a firm uh, champion of this idea, that the foundation's uh, walls uh, need to represent our work and need to reflect uh, our mission in the world. And so uh, we did deaccession the collection and took the proceeds of that and acquired uh, new works of art that are quite diverse and I think quite e exciting when uh, visitors uh, see them. You're taking on such huge systemic problems and issues. I mean, the criminal justice system. How do we begin, Darren, to think about fixing it? Well, this is where my book comes in because one of the, uh, I think, uh, tenets of uh, this new gospel idea is that we have to move from uh, projects and initiatives to really getting at the root causes. And to do that, we have to address the systems and structures that produce inequality, that produce too much disadvantage for too many Americans and people around the world, and actually compound the privilege of people like you and me who uh, are highly educated, who have strong networks, who have access uh, to influence. And so what we're interested in is how do we level the playing field? Right, so criminal justice. I, I, I wouldn't even know where to begin. Uh, so many people incarcerated. I mean, just people incarcerated who are innocent is just one facet of the problem. How do you begin to address it, though? Well, you begin to address it by an analysis of what produces the results that we get. Right. We've designed a criminal justice system to produce the results that we get. The pernicious system that we uh, have was intentionally designed. And if you dis disaggregate the, uh, the, the patterns, uh, just the pyramid, if we were to do a simple pyramid and say, what are the building blocks? The building blocks are a bail system that is a for-profit bail system that ensnares people for low-level crimes and makes it impossible for them often to even get out on bail because they're poor. It's a set of, of, uh, of laws and statutes, uh, mandatory minimums, uh, the ways in which uh, certain uh, uh, offenses are disproportionately uh, burdened uh, uh, people of color. So the difference mm -hmm. in the way uh, crack cocaine and powder cocaine, the sentences are different because there are two different populations of people who are users. And so we have to really look at that pyramid and all of the layers of that pyramid are actually quite identifiable and so it is quite possible and we are seeing the results today. And so there's good news in this country. We are incarcerating fewer people, which means fewer families and uh, fewer communities are being harmed, and we are safer than ever as a nation. So this idea of a correlation between incarceration and public safety, we believe, has been disproven. Right, and it gets harder though, Darren, with less, say, blue-collar jobs, for instance, right? And maybe even bigger than that, though, is what we were talking about earlier, which is wealth and income inequality. Is that a cause of this or an effect? It's, it's all wrapped up, isn't it? Well, it's certainly interdependent, but let's understand that the question of work in America mm -hmm. is among the most important public challenges we have as a nation because we have created a form of capitalism that 
I believe is corrosive to the idea of uh, long-term uh, national interest and certainly to long-term worker interest. So for two decades, workers, average workers in this country have really received no uh, increase in their wages. And in fact, many of them have lost benefits. My grandfather, who was uh, barely literate with a third grade education, worked as a porter at an oil company in Texas. He benefited from a profit sharing plan. Mm. And that profit sharing plan allowed him, even as a low wage worker, to live a life of dignity in retirement. Two years ago, the CEO of American Airlines put in place a profit sharing plan for workers and he was heavily criticized by Wall Street. In fact, the analysts, some of them downgraded American Airlines stock and among the things they cited as problematic was the fact that the airline wanted to share more of its profits with its workers. We're at a point in this country now where I believe the core issue of what kind of country are we going to be? Are we going to have a democratic capitalism that uses a stakeholder model of a series of interests, and those interests being, uh, of course, shareholders at the top, but workers, customers, and communities? That stakeholder uh, paradigm, I believe, we're at, a, uh, we're at a point of calling the question. And Mark Benioff's, I think, very powerful op-ed, and others, Ray Dalio, Jamie Dimon, other CEOs, Larry Fink, have all talked about this. And so I'm actually quite encouraged that we're seeing directionally uh, a change in the discourse from uh, the leaders of our uh, corporations and hopefully um, in terms of their behavior. We're seeing that on the one hand, on the corporate side, but on the government side, doesn't Donald Trump make all this so much harder? Well, at the foundation, we are not a partisan organization. So we don't look at this from the standpoint of who is president. Ideally, we want uh, to have an administration wherever we work in the world that believes in justice and fairness and equity. Um, and so in this country today, there is no doubt, uh, irrespective of who is president, that the scourge of growing inequality uh, is having a huge toll. It is part of the reason why we are an increasingly divided nation. Because people who work hard, play by the rules, find themselves feeling as though they are being left behind. And the data would indicate that too many of them are being left behind. So um, speaking of Benioff's op-ed, for instance, I mean, he talked about capitalism being dead. Does this mean we need a new form of capitalism? Do we need socialism? Is it, I, I, it doesn't sound like you want to talk about specific political figures, but you know, you've got a spectrum that has Bernie Sanders, uh, Elizabeth Warren, AOC. How far do we go in terms of infusing socialism or, or what sort of reforms could capitalism use? Well, first of all, let's say we are committed to capitalism. I think the problem is we have a kind of capitalism that is uh, distorting the potential of capitalism to deliver benefits for more people. So we have designed a form of capitalism that uh, over indexes for higher income people like you and me and people with assets. And what I think is we need the kind of capitalism that we've had in this country. So the idea of shared prosperity and economic mobility, which was uh, produced by the kind of democratic capitalism this country has enjoyed, at least for most of the 20th century, that made our form of capitalism the envy of the world. What we're seeing today does not make America the envy of the world. What we're seeing today is growing inequality, a capitalism that favors uh, the wealthy, people with assets. So if you are lucky enough 10 years ago, 15 years ago, to have assets, those assets as a result of uh, Fed policy, uh, 
um, and other reasons. Those assets um, have grown in value. But the reality is not a lot of Americans have assets. And, and so part of the challenge is how do we bring down those barriers to asset creation? For young people today, the burden of college debt makes it impossible to imagine accumulating assets because for too many, the idea of $50,000, $100,000 in debt precludes their being able to save. And so we have an entire generation of, of people who, of young people, who don't believe that their futures will be better. So that barrier, for example, of education, we've got to fix that. Right. Your book, I, and I want to ask you about the role of philanthropy in changing the system. And your book is a reference, and an, an homage maybe, uh, references Andrew Carnegie's work. How is it different from, how is your vision different from Carnegie's, and what is the role of philanthropy in trying to transform our society and our economy? Andrew Carnegie was a brilliant, radical capitalist. Uh, he was a ruthless businessman and a monopolist, for sure. But his idea that uh, everyone in this country should be literate, should be able to read, should have access to a library, was a radical idea. And so I want to situate him in that historical context. But Andrew Carnegie also believed that inequality was a normal uh, phenomenon and that there was no problem with inequality. The problem was simply how did men like him dispense the bounty that the capitalist system in this country had generated for them. And so fast forward 125 years, and I don't think uh, we uh, are simply comfortable saying that uh, people should be able to read. Yes, that was one of the root causes that Andrew Carnegie identified, but today we know more. And we know that there are root causes that are much more difficult to grapple with, like bias and prejudice and discrimination, um, things like patriarchy. For a foundation that works around the world, the issue of how women and girls are valued is a root cause of poverty. It's a root cause of the second class citizenship of women in many countries. And so we can't solve our problems without addressing some of these root causes. And so the new gospel idea that I put forth says that we need to address these root causes, that we need to understand that the people who are closest to the problems we're trying to solve often hold the answers, the solutions to unlocking uh, the, the, the solutions. So how do we think about listening to those people and not necessarily believing that because you have a PhD in economics that you have the solution. You mentioned social mobility, uh, Darren, and your Exhibit A of the benefits that can accrue to an individual who's allowed to pursue or, or can benefit from social mobility. You grew up poor, black, gay in Texas, and here you are at sort of the center of the universe. How did that story unfold? Well, my story is a story that uh, could only happen in this country. And it's a, a big part of the reason why I feel so much gratitude to America, to a nation that I believed cheered me on. I never felt, in spite of whatever other barriers you might refer to, I never felt uh, that I wasn't going to succeed because I had good public schools. I got, went to a great public university. I had scholarships financed by uh, private philanthropists. I had the Pell Grant. Um, all of these things were in my favor that made it possible for me to get on that mobility escalator and ride it as far as my own ambition would take me.
What I worry about is that for too many people, that mobility escalator has slowed down, and for some, it's actually stopped. Your personal story is a part of who you are. So I'm just wondering, how much of a narrative, a personal narrative, do you think people need for their careers? Is that necessary? Well, I think we all have a narrative. Each of us has an individual narrative, and each of us has an experience in this country that have made us who we are today. And so my narrative, I think, is punctuated by, by seminal events in my life. So in 1965, my mother and I were sitting on the porch of our little shotgun shack um, on a dirt road in rural Liberty County, Texas. And a woman approached uh, the porch and told us about a new government program called Head Start. And Head Start was going to be starting in the summer of 1965, and she wanted to enroll me. That was a seminal moment in my life as I reflect on uh, my opportunity. When I was 13 years old, I worked as a busboy uh, in a restaurant. And in that capacity, you are the lowest rung of the staff. And so me and the dishwasher were the people who were at the bottom and when you're a busboy at age 13, black in a town in Texas, your job is to be invisible. It is to take what people want to discard and as quietly as you can um, manage uh, for their comfort. But you're invisible. Your own dignity is not acknowledged. And I learned something from that experience, which is that there are so many people in this country who are invisible, whose challenges, whose um, burdens are not understood. So they are not, they're invisible often to elites, they're invisible often to people uh, in, in, in our milieu in a city like New York, but they have a life and they have a narrative and they have aspirations and dreams. And my concern is that their dreams and aspirations are being asphyxiated by a kind of pernicious inequality that makes it impossible for them to believe in the American dream. And when the American dream dies, America dies. Younger people today are facing those kinds of pressures that you're talking about because they're growing up in a world with wealth and in income inequality that didn't exist 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, or not to the extent that it does today. Are young people different today, Darren? No, they're not. Young people are ambitious. They want to believe. They have a growing uh, desire to make a difference in the world. They're idealistic, but the reality is they are uh, challenged by a burden of debt. They are concerned about climate change and the environment in ways in which we weren't. Uh, they uh, are less likely to embrace the idea of capitalism. So we know these things from the data. But at the end of the day, young people want to believe in America and want to believe in the potential of this country to deliver a shared identity as Americans, a shared pathway for mobility and economic security, um, and ultimately believe that um, their generation will in fact be a great generation. And so our job is to help them make that reality, is to lay the, uh, the groundwork, to soften the ground, if you will, uh, to make it possible for their dreams to be realized. What about tax reform in terms of addressing the differences, the disparities in, in wealth in this country? Would you support, for, for instance, uh, a wealth tax? So I'm not going to comment on any particular proposal, but I do believe that this form of inclusive capitalism that is not 
necessarily a moral argument. It's, I want to make the business case mm -hmm. for the long-term ROI if we have a more inclusive form of capitalism that will require us to think about the two R's that we capitalists don't like to talk about. The first being regulation. The fact that uh, one of the reasons we have the kind of capitalism we have today is that we don't have the right regulations to ensure a more uh, shared uh, prosperity paradigm. Um, and secondly, redistribution. Um, we capitalists don't like to talk about redistribution, but ultimately, in order to have the kind of country, the kind of society, we've got to talk about why don't we have any longer profit sharing mm -hmm. for our employees? When was that taken out of the system and why? And what would it take to incorporate and redesign that into the system so that workers shared in the bounty of their labor? And so we are going to have to talk about things that are difficult and that make us uncomfortable. But that's the journey that we need to be on in this country now. Do you have any ideas about which types of regulations? Well, I just think we've got to think very seriously about the kinds of regulations that put barriers in place. So it's not regulation for regulation's sake. It's to say, what are the barriers for working class Americans, poor people, to advance, how can we help enable right. that? How can we help to facilitate and accelerate that? What regulations would help that to happen? How do you respond to people, Darren, who say you've been co-opted, you're on the board of PepsiCo, you're president of this big foundation, you hobnob with all these CEOs, you've left the people that you're choosing to represent and you just part of that whole problem now? Well, I think it's a fair question and a fair uh, critique. Uh, I believe that uh, remaining proximate is really important. And for me, on a personal level, uh, I'm very proximate. Um, I, the idea of uh, criminal justice reform is, is not an abstraction. I have had seven of my cousins uh, serve time in state penitentiaries uh, in Louisiana and Texas. Um, I'm very familiar with um, visiting uh, prisons, not um, to work on um, a PhD um, dissertation, but, but to visit a relative. Um, so, so these ideas are not foreign to me, um, and I do my very best to, in my work and in my personal life, uh, ensure that I'm not so insulated uh, from the realities of most uh, Americans and most people in the world that I don't understand. With the, but just to be really sure. clear on this point, I don't think, because I would not want someone who uh, is, is a person who is well-to-do and who lives a life um, uh, of that is a, a, a life uh, of privilege, to feel that in order for them to be uh, legitimate or authentic, uh, they had, uh, they needed to uh, do something special to change their life around, you know, who they, who they see and who their friends are. I think what's important is that you care, that you authentically care, and that you're willing to invest your time and your resources and your philanthropy in not just ameliorating the problem, but actually addressing the underlying reason why the problem exists. And that, to me, is the measure. It's not some measure of, oh, well, how many poor people do you hang out with? And who are your friends? And do you have diverse friends? And you know, questions like that, which I think, while important, um, are less important than what you actually do with your resources and how you actually think about these public policy questions. Darren Walker, president of the Ford Foundation and author of the new book, From Generosity to Justice, A New Gospel of Wealth. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Andy. You've been watching Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.